Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this informational town hall meeting for HCPS student households. I'm Andy Jenks, and I'm with the communications and community engagement team of Henrico County Public Schools. We are thrilled that you set aside some time to be with us this evening. For most of today's event as a public service announcement, we've agreed to wear our masks, even though we are physically distanced here on this stage. But for our audience members who need to read lips or who use closed captioning, we will be putting this recording on YouTube tomorrow for its closed captioning capabilities. But for the remainder of this evening's program, myself and all of our speakers here this evening will be keeping our masks on. As you know, last Thursday, the school board adopted a plan largely recommended by Superintendent Amy Cashwell to gradually expand in-person learning opportunities. We'll do that in phases beginning in late November and gradually giving more students the option to come back in December and then in February of next year. As for tonight, we'll call this a modified town hall event that's designed specifically for our Henrico County student households. And by that, I mean we've assembled a panel of eight folks here on stage this evening, principals, HCPS leaders. There's no live audience, but we've received approximately 815 of your questions which were submitted in advance. More on how we're going to use the questions in just a moment. But first, let's introduce our panel. And to my right is Dr. Danny Avula from the Henrico County Health Department. We're so happy to have you here with us today this evening. Danny, thank you very much. To my left is Susan Moore, our Director of Facilities. Dr. Stacy Austin is one of our three directors of elementary school education. Dr. Thomas Farrell Jr. is director of high school education. Tracy Spain is joining us from Springfield Park Elementary School where she is the principal. Thomas McCauley is the principal of Pocahontas Middle School. Donis Davenport is director of exceptional education and on the other side of the stage is the principal of Hermitage High School, Dr. Michael Jackson. And with that, I will pause to welcome in our school board vice chair representing the Three Chop District, Mrs. Mickey Ogburn, to bring us some greetings. Hello, everyone. On behalf of the members of the school board and the Henrico Schools team, I want to welcome you to our virtual town hall this evening. We are here for you and know that this is a difficult time for all of our children and families. I'm confident that we can continue to move forward and get through this difficult time as a community by working together and turning to those that you trust for support. I want to take a few moments to thank all of our teachers and staff members for all that they have been doing for our students. They have been working tirelessly to help our students continue to learn and grow, and they've never wavered in their dedication. Thank you all for watching tonight and for participating and turning in all of those great questions. We have a great team of members who are ready to answer your most pressing questions. So I'll turn it over to Andy to get our town hall underway. Thanks so much. Mrs. Ogburn, thank you. As for today's format, we'll be here for about the next hour and a half. And out of 815 questions submitted in advance, <laughs> I, in this capacity as moderator, consulted with the folks that you see here on stage so that we can discuss the most common questions and come prepared with quality answers, a thoughtful discussion, and time well spent this evening. Does that mean we will answer every question here this evening? Most certainly not, but we'll continue to keep questions updated and new answers publicized on our website, henricoschools.us, as well as other forum similar to the one that you're participating in this evening. Let's first recap the highlights of our path forward. And this is a shortened version of what was adopted by the school board last Thursday. Last week, as you may know, the HCPS Health Committee recommended to expand optional in-person learning opportunities for students in pre-K through 12. That includes continuing a fully virtual option for pre-K through 12, providing a phased-in approach to in-person learning by level, prioritizing elementary students, using six-foot social distancing for classroom seating, maintaining cohort groupings as much as possible, 
creating one-way traffic patterns in hallways and adjusting the secondary master schedule to stagger and extend transition times. And we're using a staggered return model that prioritize, uh, prioritizes our early learners. For example, this would mean the first day of in-person learning for students in pre-K through grade two who choose the in-person option would be November 30th. Students in grades three through five will begin on December 7th. And then January 4th through 8th will be a virtual learning week for all students during that first week after winter break. Grades six through 12 will remain in the predominantly virtual setting until the second semester. At that level, we will continue to expand our limited in-person learning for select groups of students as we are doing right now in the first nine weeks. This means students in grades six through 12 in career and technical education, special education, and English learners who are receiving in-person instruction on campus will continue to have those experiences and will work to expand those opportunities throughout the second nine weeks. In the second semester, we'll offer an advanced start for our sixth and ninth grade students, first year of middle school, first year of high school, to return on February 1st and 2nd to familiarize themselves with their new school environment and their day one and day two schedules. February 3rd will be a virtual day for all middle and high school students, grades six through 12. And then on February 4th, all other middle and high school students who choose the in-person option will begin. A little thinking behind that is that starting secondary students at the beginning of the second semester provides administration and opportunity to rework their master schedules. And the natural breaking point between semesters allows for more course continuity as student schedules may shift with the addition of the in-person option. And one last word on exceptional education. The timeline for our students with special needs follows the information you see on the screen. The following populations have the option to return four full days, Wednesday being an asynchronous or virtual learning day, November 30th, early childhood special education, K through fifth grade self-contained integrated services students, and then a week later, December 7th, secondary self-contained integrated services students, all the while continuing to have uh, access to limited in-person support. And with all that being said, depending on health data, the school division may have to delay or alter these timelines, temporarily shift them perhaps as health conditions dictate, which may involve students returning to the virtual model depending on what happens with health data. With that in mind, it is now time to turn to our panel. And we finished the introduction on a note about public health, and that brings in, brings in an opportunity to speak with Dr. Avula. And a word about the questions, I should say, before we get into that is, among the 815 questions that were submitted in advance, our folks looked at them for common themes and questions that were being asked in different ways, but similar uh, answers that can be provided by the school system. And that's what our panel will attempt to uh, do throughout this evening. And so these questions were those that were submitted by you, our student households, and we thank you very much for doing that. So Dr. Avula, we will start with you. Can you talk about the factors the health committee weighed in making this recommendation at this time? And can you speak about the adequacy of the HCPS COVID-19 health plan? Absolutely, Andy. So I've had the pleasure of working with my HCPS colleagues over the last few months as part of the health committee. Um, and during that time, we've watched the data here in Henrico County, but also throughout the region very carefully. Um, obviously important to look at what was happening with case rates and trends and percent positivity here in Henrico, but also important to see the bigger picture because so many of our uh, faculty and staff actually live outside of the county and the regional trend does have some bearing on what's happening here in Henrico. Um, so the data was a really important part of uh, leading up to this decision, you know, looking at the way that this pandemic has moved over the last few months. We've seen peaks and we've seen valleys. Um, and we, we right now are at a, a much lower place than we were at either the May peak or the uh, August peak of disease. 
Um, but also, in addition to what was happening with data and data trends, the CDC and VDH both very clearly outlined uh, this, a school system's ability to, to engage in five core mitigation strategies, things like a commitment to correct and consistent mask wearing, uh, the ability to uh, in, enforce hand washing or hand hygiene or support hand washing and hand hygiene, uh, to be able to really commit to physical distancing, uh, to have a good cleaning protocol in place, and then lastly, uh, to have a really, really good integration with local health departments around contact tracing and case investigation. Uh, and, and so throughout the course of the last few months as we've worked together as health department and school system, uh, we've, we've vetted some of these things and we've actually gotten to practice our contact tracing and case investigation together. Uh, and so I feel like we're in a really good place in, in when we identify a case, which we inevitably will. There's no way we're going to create a scenario where we don't have a case in a school. But when we do identify a case, we'll be able to uh, contact trace quickly and contain that that spread of disease so that we're not having mass spread in schools. And what are some of the lessons or, or sharing of information that has gone on among school divisions in Central Virginia and, and throughout all of Virginia, those that have already opened or gradually expanded their in-person learning as well? Are there lessons to be learned from that that you see Henrico, for example, looking to implement as well? Yeah, I think we have watched carefully as different school systems throughout the state and throughout the country have, have reopened. Uh, I think certainly the overwhelming evidence that particularly at the younger end of the age spectrum, kids are not transmitting uh, disease in schools and schools are not driving community transmission. That was a really important factor for us in making this recommendation. But we've also looked at the lived experience of school systems that actually have been back this first quarter and we're seeing, yes, they are seeing cases, but as, as a school system is able to execute on those five core strategies, they're actually able to contain disease very effectively. And so uh, here in Central Virginia, we've also created a forum for our public school and private school partners to share best practices together, to talk about what's working in classrooms, to talk about tips and tricks like uh, using, you know, uh, uh, wet noodles or pool noodles to, to help keep space between kids what things can be pushed outside, what things sh should stay inside. So we've, we've had an opportunity over the last couple of months to just hear the experience of people who are doing this and have built some confidence in, in hearing those success stories. And for those who are, are just joining us this evening, we did a, a town hall just a short while ago that was designed for an audience of HCPS employees. And one of the questions that came up at that particular time, which I think is relevant also to our parent audience, is what about lunch? especially at the elementary school level. We've talked about masks in a moment. We'll, we'll talk about protective barriers and some other things that are being put in place in schools, but what can you share about the act of eating lunch in a school when in-person learning expands? Yeah, so, you know, obviously to eat lunch, we've got to remove our masks. And, uh, you know, while we want as much mask wearing as possible, because masks are one of the most effective ways to stop the spread of disease, uh, we know that we can't do that while eating lunch. Uh, it's why the executive order around mask wearing doesn't apply to people in restaurants who are eating or drinking. Um, now, what we also know is that this disease is primarily spread through the spread of respiratory droplets. And when people are eating, they're generally not producing a lot of respiratory droplets. but that the, 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 it's still, the possibility exists that you might have some e escape of respiratory droplets. So that's why it's really important to be committed to distancing while eating, because we're not going to have masks in those situations. But if we have six feet or more of distance, uh, then we can, we can really reduce the potential of spread. Dr. Abula, thank you. So uh, let's turn our attention now to Susan Moore, who is our Director of Facilities. And we've, we've spoken about some of the protective actions that are being taken and can be taken. There's also a lot of changes inside our building. And I think you can speak to, uh, for starters, our protective barriers that are being put in place in our main offices, our classrooms, et cetera. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Dr. Avula. Uh, so what we started with is we began with acrylic uh, cough guard or sneeze guard barriers, we supplied them at all of the common areas within the building, particularly your main office, and the areas where uh, parents or kids would need to come in for registration or um, just getting things organized for school. Uh, from that point, we went on to add desk guards to all of the student desk as well as all of the teachers desk and these desk guards are very similar to the cough guards that you'll see in the main offices if you visit one of our schools uh, we established six foot distancing as our distancing for the cl the desk within the classrooms and we have added 
signage throughout the building to remind our staff as well as our students and any visitors of what COVID symptoms are, what symptoms should keep you from coming into our buildings, uh, as well as that masks are required in order to come into our buildings. We're using floor dots to put on the floor to show people where they can wait and where they can stand at the acrylic barriers within our offices. And we'll also be doing some marking to indicate the one-way direction in hallways and other locations. And like our teachers, like our families and students, I think everyone, including folks in the facilities department, are reimagining a typical workday. And I, our, our wood shop comes to mind for me. And they've been very busy lately custom making those barriers. And we got a short look at them a, a brief moment ago. Mm -hmm. But these are barriers that are being made available to student desks, teacher workspaces, other common areas of the school. Is that a fair way to put it? That is. I will tell you the barriers that we made within our carpentry shop those are the heavier barriers that we put in the public locations. The barriers that we provided for the school desks are lighter weight and we feel like a little more appropriate for um, access to students' hands. All so right. we, we feel like they're a little bit safer option than the heavier barriers on the, All on right. the main office desks. Susan, thank you very much. Our next question submitted from our student households is, Will students be required to wear masks in the school building at all times, or will they be able to take them off once they're in their individual workspace? And for that, we'll turn to the principal of Pocahontas Middle School, Thomas McCauley. Thomas, some thoughts on mask wearing in the school buildings. Yes, and I appreciate this question. I've received this question numerous times myself as well. And first, I want to share that school safety and the safety of students and the staff is a shared responsibility. There is onus on the students as well to do their part to ensure their peers and the adults working with the students are safe. And that really begins in the home, ironically. So before a family really makes the decision of in-person learning or to continue with virtual learning, they need to, if they decide in-person learning is the route to go and best for their child, they need to um, agree to some expectations. And one of those expectations is for students to wear throughout the school day their masks. Now, we want our students to be successful in meeting those requirements and expectations. So we have a lot of PPE supplies, including masks, at the ready. That first and foremost begins on the buses. So if a student does leave their home forgetful of their mask, or maybe while at the bus stop um, it's broken or has gotten soiled because it fell off, the bus drivers will be equipped with um, some disposable masks for them to wear that are VDH and CDC approved. And once the students get off the bus or once they're dropped off at school by a parent or guardian, we will also have teachers at the ready and staff members at the ready at various entry points for the doors, um, also equipped with VDH and CDC approved masks there as well as another layer of protection and another opportunity for students um, to get the, the appropriate materials and equipment necessary to be safe. And, and finally, on the first day of school, as they enter into their classrooms, every school has been provided two different cloth style masks, much like the ones I'm wearing, again, VDH and also CDC approved. And again, we have enough for two for every single student on the first day of school. One will be provided to that student. And again, teachers will also have additional masks at the ready should one be um, necessary. So the short answer to the question is yes, the expectation will be for students to wear masks throughout the entire portion of the school day outside of eating for lunch. And we will have the right materials on hand to ensure our students are successful. And we'll be spending the majority of our time in the beginning educating our students about their appropriate way to wear their masks and why it's so necessary. And I am confident in the students of Henrico County Public Schools to rise to this challenge and to meet the expectations and requirements. Thomas, thank you very much. I'll bring it over now to Dr. Stacy Austin, who oversees one of our three directors overseeing elementary schools. And while we know going in that expanded in-person learning won't be for everyone or for every family, it will be for some families. And I think there's something to be said for practicing or building a tolerance for mask wearing. And that's especially important at the elementary school level. Absolutely. Thank you. I want to thank all of the families that are tuning in today um, because we want to provide you with the information that you need to make the best choice for your family. And one of those choices, one of those factors is mask wearing. And so we want to be clear 
it will be expected. And so we, even with our youngest learners, our pre-kindergartners, all the way through fifth grade, we are expecting them to have an appropriately fit mask, one that will stay on securely and properly. We are looking for our families to help us because mask wearing is a trainable skill. As a young man, when I was young, I had to wear glasses. And let me tell you, those glasses did not want to stay right here. But I had to train myself, and I went through a lot of broken glasses. And uh, the optometrist in my hometown loved my dad. And so we, we, it's a trainable skill. And so one thing that we need to have you consider is any skill that's trainable needs to be practiced, and it needs to be practiced properly. And the best teacher to do that is you as a parent, as a loved one, as a legal guardian. We're asking you to get started now. Because if you're considering in-person as your learning option, that is exactly what we need you to do. During virtual learning even, have your student wear the mask to see if there's a tolerance buildup. Again, trainable skill. Feedback needs to be kind, specific, and helpful for your youngest. And certainly, there are a lot of other factors, but we, we're going to need your help on that, <coughs> uh, families. We're going to ask you, and of course, we're going to do the same when they're with us in school. The majority of our students have that ability to wear the mask properly, and we'll be expecting it back to that shared culture of safety. Even our youngest students are going to help us. Our youngest and our brightest are going to be the model for the rest of us. And lastly, I will just say we know our students. We know children. They're going to want to have the best looking mask. And we're going to be asking you as a parent to make sure it's the best fit as well as having some style. Stacy, thanks. We're going to spend more time on the elementary school day in just a little while, but I'll turn it over now to Donna Davenport. Donna, you oversee services for our students with special needs, and, and maybe it works a little bit differently uh, with, with those students. Maybe you can elaborate on that. Uh, oh. That was quite startling. <laughs> Absolutely, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> so the vast majority of students with disabilities are going to be able to wear masks and adhere to those safety requirements that are set forth for all of our students in Henrico County. But I know that there may be many of you who are um, listening tonight who have students, who have children, who have developmental delays um, or disabilities or health concerns which may prohibit them from being able to consistently wear a mask in the same manner as um, some of their peers might be able to wear a mask. And I want you to know that your students are still able to come to school. Um, if you and your IEP team or if you decide that the in-person learning environment is the best option for your child to be able to engage in instruction, we can make exceptions for students with disabilities who have developmental delays or health concerns which prohibit them from being able to wear a mask. Some students may have additional IEP goals that work on building tolerance for mask wearing, if that's appropriate from a health standpoint. Teachers and service providers who are working with students who are not able to wear a mask because of their disability would be provided with additional protective equipment. They would have their cloth masks, just like all of our other teachers and service providers would have, but they'd also have access to a plexiglass face shield, which would provide a second layer of protection in that classroom environment. If the teacher or the service provider has to engage in toileting or in diaper changing or in feeding activities with students and students are unable to wear a mask in those environments, we, we will provide gloves, we will provide gowns, disposable gowns, and we also are providing additional plexiglass barriers in those classrooms for our students. Our teachers are going to be charged with creating classroom environments that create individual learning spaces for students who are unable to wear masks so that students can engage in their individual programming while still maintaining distancing from their peers. Um, there are a lot of individual considerations that come into play, so if you are a parent of a student with a disability, make sure that you're talking openly and honestly with your child's case manager and with the administrator of your schools to talk about those concerns. Donna, thank you very much. Our next question submitted from our student household population is, will kids and staff have daily temperature checks? Will there be testing? 
what other screening will be performed? And for that, we'll start with Tracy Spain, who's the principal of Springfield Park Elementary School. And I do want to acknowledge Tanya Holmes from Harvey Elementary School, who was sitting with us for our staff session earlier today. But uh, Tracy, thank you for being with us. And, and so talk to us a little bit about what happens starting at the elementary level. So as a school system, we pride ourselves on a culture of safety. And so completing health screener and temperature checks at home will be vitally important for all of our families to do prior to getting on the bus or arriving at school. Um, we will be performing random temperature checks for students and staff throughout the day and encouraging proper hand washing techniques as well. Uh, we will also have physical distancing on our school buses. Um, every child will set aisle, window, aisle, window, and they will, the siblings will be able to set together on the bus. Uh, buses will be loaded from front to back, so kind of a first on, last off type situation, and that will limit the students from passing each other um, on the bus as well. And all students will also be assigned seats, and that will help with uh, contact tracing in the event that someone may be exposed. Tracy, thank you very much. I'll move on now, uh, and this is a, a topic relevant to all levels, but I'll have Michael Jackson from Hermitage address it. The question is, my family depends on free meals. Will there still be an option at each school for pickup? We don't have a schedule that allows us to drive further away or meet the bus stops during the school day. And so, Michael, first of all, welcome in. And at the high school level and really at middle and elementary as well, what's the answer on meal service? Well, thank you. That's a great question as well. Uh, fortunately for HCPS, we will continue to distribute meals um, on a weekly basis. Um, you know, we're very fortunate to be in this position to serve breakfast and lunch daily. Um, when we transition to the, in, the phased in approach for in person and we go to virtual Wednesdays, those meals will be distributed on um, Tuesday afternoons, well, Tuesdays during, for breakfast and lunch. Um, so we're very fortunate to be in this situation. We continue to deliver meals. And I want to thank you to all the food service uh, employees and his cafeteria managers for continuing this process uh, since March. All right, Michael. And uh, now we get into a collection of questions that's going to drill down a little bit more into the school day. We'll start with the elementary school day. This question, and, and I'll start with Dr. Austin. If kids continue virtual learning, will their teacher be the same? I wish this was an easy answer, but it is not. This is a very complicated answer because there are a number of factors that are going into this decision. Number one is the number of students whose families, after hearing all of the information, make the decision to stay in the virtual environment. The second factor are those same families making an opposing decision, and that is to send them back to in-person. And then we have also the same decision happening among some of our staff. So all three of those factors come together in, while we're analyzing the school infrastructure and the ability to distance and safely space our students that are in person. All of those things lead to one conclusion. We will have to make adjustments. We will do our best to limit those. We will do our best to take advantage of the unbelievable relationships, the bonds that have happened during virtual learning those are going to remain. And so we want to take advantage of those when possible. But there are so many factors going in that there is no guarantee. And I know that parents want to know that answer, but we would love to give it to you. But at this time, we are still determining those, those factors. We're still making those decisions. And uh, we're going to need your help. And one of the things uh, that we'll talk about later today is how you let us know what your choice is. And I need every single family to let us know because that's how we make the best decisions. We are counting on you families to let us know your thoughts. If you have questions, that's what we're going to do here tonight and further along the way. We're going to try to get you the answers you need in a clear, concise format so you can make that decision. So again, complicated question, an even more complicated answer. Stacy, thank you. I'll spend some time uh, on the middle and high school level, too, on the same question, and, and this would be for, for Dr. Farrell. Just same question about students continuing virtual learning. Will the teacher stay the same? Maybe you can elaborate on some of the additional nuances at the middle and high school level with students having way more than just one teacher. 
Right, so similar to what uh, Dr. Austin said, um, a lot of that will depend on the information that we receive from our um, families with respect to their decision to remain virtual or to come into the building. And also um, the, the, the staff that we have that are virtual or um, working in our school buildings. Uh, it's extremely complicated. And we understand that over the course of the, the first couple of months, you know, teachers and students have built a rapport and, and we respect that and we will do everything that we can to maintain those relationships. However, it becomes extremely complicated when you look at, um, you know, choice with respect to, you know, students either coming into the building or remaining virtual and the same thing with teachers. Our main priority will be to maintain the classes that our students are currently taking. So that may mean that there's a change in teacher or a change in a class period. Um, but again, our main priority is to make sure that our students, particularly at the high school level, are able to maintain their classes because those classes have implications towards uh, students meeting graduation requirements. But again, we cannot guarantee that all students will have the same teachers uh, once they return to school in some capacity. All right, Thomas, thank you. And we'll stay with you for this next question where I think we begin to get in, into more detail about what the school day looks like, both for expanded in-person learning as well as virtual learning under those same circumstances. And the question that comes into us is, is there any difference for the learning schedule between virtual and in-person study? And Dr. Farrell, we'll start at the middle and high school level. Sure. So there will not be a difference in the learning schedule for students who are learning virtually versus students who are, who are learning in person. Uh, for example, the middle school schedule, uh, the students who are learning virtually and the students who are learning in person will operate from that day one, day two um, schedule with you know, middle school students beginning the day at around 8.30 with advisory and ending the, ending the day around two o'clock with an additional hour and 15 minutes of asynchronous learning. Um, students who are learning virtually and in, and in person will also have extended breaks. For our students who are learning virtually, that gives them time to sort of rest their eyes from looking at the computer screen, or get a snack, uh, use a restroom, stretch for a little bit. And for our students who are learning in person, that gives uh, all of us an, an additional time to um, do some spot cleaning to ensure that, you know, spaces are being cleaned in between, you know, class changes. And it also gives us an opportunity to allow for smooth transitions, um, making sure that students are, you know, remaining distanced in the hallways. And for high school students, you know, same thing. Um, high school students will start their day at 9 o'clock, which is a first period, and they'll end the day at 2.55, again, with... Um, academic enrichment time built in, which will be about 20 minutes. Also extended breaks to allow for spot cleaning for our um, students who are learning in person and you know, for our students who are learning virtually, again, an opportunity to you know, rest your eyes from the computer screen, grab a snack, use the restroom, you know, maybe walk around a little bit. Um, but those schedules will remain the same, again, with high school operating from a you know, day one, day two schedule. Dr. Farrell, thank you. Back to Dr. Austin for a word on the elementary uh, version of how this will, will look. Certainly. Uh, at the elementary level, we, we, we are going to do everything we can. We prioritize leveling those two experiences in the schedule. And so we wanted to keep as much consistency as possible. So we've come a long way, and I mean a long way, since March. And we have learned a lot about predominantly virtual learning. We've learned from the experts in the field we've trained our teachers we've improved that experience we've we've really gone after excellence in the virtual environment so we want to maintain that level toward that end for our students who remain in the virtual environment in person we wanted to mirror that in the developmental appropriateness of the kinds of pedagogy the kinds of learning activities that are happening every day in the virtual world will then complement what we're going to be doing in person. Prior to March, that's what we did. That's what teachers do. They are great at reaching out, connecting with kids, and the context changed. Not the work, just the context of the change. So now we're going to mirror those and we're going to blend the two and try to find the best of both worlds. So similar to the secondary approach, there will be opportunities for in-person learning 
at times, and then virtual learning at times, and there will also be some moments where that will be blended together. For instance, our lamps, which is library, art, music, those categories are the ones that will be doing an instructional model where the virtual will be coming into the homeroom, but also into the home. And so those groups can be blended together for strategic impact for instruction. Wednesdays are another good example where it will be an asynchronous independent learning day where all students will have access to their teacher for part of the day and then they will be doing blended learning. They'll be doing some independent, some asynchronous work in some of our digital platforms. Uh, they'll be doing some self-reflection, some writing, all of those best practices that exist in both of the virtual world and the in-person world. But so we've, we've really done what we can to level that field. I will say there was a small change in our primary schedule because they were ending at 1235 and now we're gonna bump that up to 105 and add some extra opportunities uh, during in-person learning and in virtual learning. Stacy, thank you. And I'm gonna to go to Donison in just a second for exceptional education and some perspective on that. But Tracy, it makes me think of, uh, we can talk and show bullet points and slides on what the schedule is, is going to look like. Can you share some insights on what it looks and feels like to be in an elementary school classroom and maybe paint a picture for our students and families about what school might, what, what might be different about school for those who go for the in-person learning option? So um, in, in the in-person setting, we're going to have a desk that are physically distanced by six feet. We'll have the um, safety protocols in place that we talked about earlier. And as far as instruction goes, students will still be working in small groups with their teacher. They will be uh, collaborating with their partners, uh, either virtually or within the, the school classroom. And they're just going to, it will look different than it did pre-March, but they're going to have the same learning experiences that uh, the virtual students are having and alongside the in-person students. Tracy, thank you. Now, Donna's the original question is, is there any difference for the learning schedule between virtual and in-person? How does that work with stu our students with special needs? So, if I can encourage you as a parent to do anything, what I would say is stay in close communication with your child's teacher and the administrator. There may be some differences in scheduling for especially our youngest learners. Our students who are in our early childhood programs um, already work at a different type of schedule, a different type of day than our school age students do. And that may look different. And you're gonna want to talk closely with your child's teacher as we're able to roll these systems out so that you have a clear understanding. But what we're going to do for our students who come in for in-person instruction is we're really going to work to maximize the time that they're in the buildings to work toward their independent goals, to work toward those academic skills that they would not necessarily be able to access in a virtual setting. And I really encourage you as you're making these decisions for your students, for your children, to do so from the perspective of what's required for them. What do they need? So many of our kids have flourished in the virtual environment. And so many of our kids may need that type of in-person support. So work closely with your children's teachers because things are going to look a little different for them coming back. Donis, thank you. It is about 7.08 in the evening. And so I want to reset for those who are just joining us on our website or who are chatting along with us on our Facebook Live right now. What we're talking through is a summary of approximately 800 or so questions that were submitted to the school division in advance and then organized in such a way that they are best representing the questions that were submitted by you, our student households. And as we move on, one of the next questions that was most commonly asked by folks in our parent communities is, what happens when COVID cases arise in school. I will turn to Dr. Avula for that. And, and Danny, you didn't um, obfuscate the issue. COVID cases will happen. They have happened in schools. It's how we prepare and protect one another. So maybe you can walk us through what has happened in other school divisions and articulate how this school division is preparing as well. Sure. So, you know, our goal, once we identify a case, is to 
isolate that case and limit the potential exposures of individuals, but then to quarantine those who may have been exposed. The way we do that is through the process of case investigation and contact tracing. So uh, when an individual tests positive for COVID, uh, we would ask that they go ahead and report that to someone at the school or directly to the health department. Often we find that uh, the, the direct reporting to the health department gives us about a 24 hour lead time because otherwise we're waiting for that electronically to come to the health department and we can start that case investigation right away. What we do is we ask the individual, who have you been around? Who have you spent time with? And we, um, we quantify that because to meet the epidemiological definition of a close contact, you have to have spent 15 minutes within six feet of somebody over the course of a 24 hour period. Um, now, in the school setting, we'll be able to identify that fairly easily. Uh, outside of the school setting, usually it's household contacts, but there may be others. And so we would, we would do an in-depth interview to try, to try to identify who those folks are. Anyone who meets that definition of a close contact would be asked to quarantine for 14 days, meaning that they don't go to school, that they stay home. Why 14 days? Because 14 days is the longest possible incubation period of COVID. Once you've been exposed, you could potentially uh, become infected and test positive anytime along that 14 day interval. So it's important for parents to understand that because there will be times where their child may have met that close contact definition and now has to switch to virtual or stay home for 14 days. And it's really important for them to understand that on the front end. Now, as we have, uh, my colleagues in other counties have done this, um, we have not seen, outside of a few cases, we have not seen widespread outbreaks in schools. Um, what we've largely seen is a quickly identified positive case, a few people who have been exposed who have then been quarantined, and then uh, the, the return of everybody to the classroom. So we're really encouraged by what we're seeing in other school districts right now. And you've spent some time describing the contact tracing process, and maybe let's spend just another minute on it, because uh, one, one question that I think a lot of us in the school system receive is that, let's say there's a positive case, and the positive case was identified to be in an office setting or a room. That doesn't necessarily mean the person in the gymnasium 250 yards away is going to be identified through the contact tracing process. And so you've elaborated on that again. I wondered if you would emphasize how folks are identified through contact tracing. Yeah, and remember that this is a disease that is spread through close contact, that you have got to be spending a significant amount of time in close proximity with an individual. And so if you did have a case that showed up somewhere else in the building, but you weren't spending 15 minutes or longer within six feet of that individual, you would not be counted as a close contact. And so that uh, time of exposure is really important. We, we tease that out through interview. We tease that out through uh, understanding kind of the rhythm of the classroom and it, where there are opportunities for kids to have spent that much time together. And then one other tool that we can use is the COVIDWISE app. Um, if you go to the VDH website or to the uh, Henrico Health Department website, uh, on, the, on the front page, there's a, a, a button to press to download the, or, or to learn about the COVIDWISE app. Uh, and it's a way that electronically monitors for, with other phones who also have the app downloaded, whether you've met that definition of a close contact. So it can be a helpful adjunct in us identifying other close contacts. And, and I'll tell you the reason I bring it up, it's because the school division has made a commitment to be notifying all of the faculty and all the student households at a school when we do become aware of a positive case in the current environment that almost always involves an employee, but our students and families should expect to be notified in the event that a positive case comes to our attention. In the process of being notified, those who are identified as close contacts were told ahead of time. They were reached out specifically by those performing the contact tracing process. So the notification comes in at least two different forms. Yep. Right. Um, same question, and I'll start with Tracy Spain and then go to, to Thomas McCauley for some middle school perspective. But the question is, what happens when a, a COVID case arises in a school? Elaborate for us on the discussions that unfold, not only at your school, but throughout elementary about how to address that. So first of all, um, it's really important. We all have a role to play in the safety and, and health of our children. So it's important for families to know that if they have been exposed, uh, to contact the school and let us know that so that we can walk through what the next steps are with you and your family. As far as the building goes, um, we will conduct random temperature checks and if someone should be symptomatic throughout the course of the school day, 
we do have a health isolation room at all of our school buildings. And we have protocols in place uh, with our school nursing staff to ensure that everyone is safe and healthy um, as far as returning to school. Tracy, thanks. And Thomas, at the middle school level, uh, there's a role for our school-based COVID liaisons as well. Would you describe that? Yes, absolutely. And again, every school across the division has a COVID liaison. And that individual is often the principal or the principal's designee. And I am fortunate to be the COVID liaison for my school, so I can speak firsthand about the experiences that I've had there. And we meet for about 90 minutes once a week. We meet with different directors, particularly over facilities and also school health services. And we first discuss the trends and you know, what are we seeing? And are any guidelines changing from the Virginia Department of Health or the CDC? Um, after we're armed with that information, um, the COVID liaisons really advocate for needs of our schools and what do we need and how are we gonna maintain the inventories of the PPE supplies that we are receiving? And we are being tasked with ensuring we have four weeks of supplies on hand at all times and it is the liaison's responsibility to make sure we do have the orders placed in time. And just to give an example of the robust job that a liaison has is to discuss just hand sanitizing and I'll discuss the wipe specifically. Every student will wipe down his or her learning space at the end of every class. That could be 4,000 wipes a single day or more um, for each school, and so we need to maintain and track the inventory. So again, we are happy to do that work because we are so fortunate to have um, the supplies coming in from the county. The county has dedicated themselves to ensuring that our students and our staffs are safe and have the necessary supplies. So not only are we discussing masks, but also in some situations, gowns and gloves when necessary, um, the hand sanitizer. And so really the liaison is the point of contact for maintaining inventory. Another chief and important job of the liaison is to be the contact, should there be a case of COVID and a positive case, um, to immediately reach out to central office, to reach out to the school health services and start the process of contact tracing and communication. So the jobs are, are many of for the liaison, but again, they've received the training and through the constant meetings um, of the experts and the information being provided, it is helping to ensure the schools are prepared in the unfortunate case that a positive case may come out, but ideally to put a practice in place to mitigate that from ever occurring. Thomas, thank you very much. Switching gears to another uh, question submitted by our parent community. Another locality just released a COVID-19 dashboard as a means to keep families updated on confirmed cases. The most up-to-date information is published at the end of every week. It lists all schools in the county and gives the number of cases, if applicable, for each school. The tools, in addition to the 24-hour reporting required by each school to report confirmed cases to their specific community. And this is one that uh, I would, it would be my pleasure to handle, and it gives us uh, an opportunity to mention what we have on a page of our website, henricoschools.us slash return to school. Again, that's henricoschools.us slash return to school. Go to that page. You'll see something that we've had on that page for several weeks, which is in a listing of from August, September, and October of the positive cases that have uh, been, in, that we have been become aware of in our schools, almost all of them involving our employees. And it's a commitment that we've made to you, our student households, of keeping you updated when and where those notifications go out. In almost every case, the notifications have been made to the faculties and the school communities of a given building, but we also post it publicly on our website so that you're able to track on a daily basis when and where those positive cases are known to us. So once again, that website, which has been up for several weeks now, is henricoschools.us slash return to school, henricoschools.us slash return to school. Switching gears, how will students in specialty centers be impacted if they remain virtual? My daughter is in the 10th grade in the ACA program at Tucker. Will she be able to remain in her specialty center with the virtual option. And for that, I'll start with Dr. Farrell. Excellent, that's a great question, Andy. Thank you for that question. Uh, so first to the parent, congratulations to your daughter on being accepted to the uh, ACA program at Tucker High School. Um, we will make every effort to ensure that students' high school programming remains intact. So if your student decides to remain virtual, 
um, there will not be an impact on her ability to remain in a specialty center. And that goes not just for Tucker's ACA program, but for all of our high school specialty centers. And um, in addition, our middle school IB program, as well as Geyser. Um, periods may change in terms of, you know, when uh, classes are offered, teachers may change, but high school and middle school programming will remain intact for students who choose to remain virtual or um, return for in-person learning. I would also like to add that for students who are not in specialty centers, the same thing would apply. Um, your programming would remain intact. We understand that our students spend an extensive amount of time working with their families and school counselors and connecting with teachers on the, the, the best course and pathway through high school and middle school um, that meets their interests. And we wanna make sure that that remains intact. So uh, whether it's a specialty center or courses that a student is currently taking in middle or high school, they will remain in those courses. Again, the only thing that may change may be class periods or teachers depending on uh, the data that we receive with respect to um, options for students and also options for staff. Dr. Farrell, thank you. Next question is more about the elementary uh, level and if my fifth grader remains virtual for the year, will he or she be invited to join in any end of year in-person activities or celebrations so as not to miss out on her fifth grade year by choosing to remain safely at home? Same question would apply for eighth grade students and high school seniors. Dr. Austin, maybe let's start from the uh, elementary school perspective on that. Certainly, and thank you for that question. Uh, our, our teachers work really hard to create learning experiences that are memorable. Ones that our students will talk about when they're explaining what school was like to their own children when they have them. Well, but honestly, no assessment and no science experiment is gonna stick in the memory like a school tradition. Our school traditions are what make our schools special. And so, and our principals, our teachers, our parents, our PTAs, our, all of our boosters have worked so hard to remain in those traditions. They've looked at new ways, new creative ways. We've had a virtual back to school night for the first time ever. We had drive up parades to say goodbye to retirees. We had instructional pickups that were based on the alphabet of your last name. We will make sure that you get the chance to enjoy the school traditions that you're gonna remember. When you're 25, you're gonna go back and you're gonna remember that fifth grade graduation ceremony, hopefully, or that eighth grade moving up ceremony. Or I love what the division did last year in partnership with the Richmond International Raceway. No one, no one will be able to touch that story when they're comparing graduations of this past year. So we will do whatever it takes but I will caution you, all of those events that I just described were guided and informed by the latest health metrics. And the experts in the field really was the driving force behind that creativity, behind that innovation. We took what was and made it what it could be given the context. And so we wanna make sure that whether you are in person or virtual, those school traditions, those experiences, those memories of a lifetime, stay in play for everybody. Stacy, thank you. The next question will allow us to get some additional school perspective. And the question is as follows, will the kids have the same type of experience as they are seeing now? For example, live instruction and activities. Will teachers change and how soon will you communicate the details? Will there be a dedicated teacher for virtual learning or split between in-person and virtual? Tracy, I'll start with you, and I realize that was about six questions in one. Uh, we'll, we'll go one by one down the list. How about that? All right. Um, their experiences will be designed with intentionality. Um, we'll ensure that we've got engagement and quality instruction for the students and that we are supporting their individual needs. Um, the students might be asked to collaborate with uh, students that are participating virtual through the computer. They may be collaborating with each other in the classroom. Um, they might also be working on digital learning programs that, uh, that the district has provided for us as well. All right, Tracy, thank you. Thomas McCauley, principal of Pocahontas Middle School, your thoughts on that? Yes, first, I absolutely love this question. We're talking about instruction. This is what we're geared to do. This is where our passion lies. So again, 
to whomever asked this question. They did ask a lot of questions all in a row. I think they had a passion too. So I'm gonna to try to match that also. So again, we are going to do everything we can to ensure our students remain engaged in the learning process. Until we really know what the numbers are, it's hard to speak with true finite numbers, but from a holistic pedagogy um, standpoint, from a lesson delivery standpoint, we will be focused on the Henrico Learner Profile, deeper learning, um, those are going on now, but we're gonna be able to do so much more as we start to combine, possibly, um, students in person and also working virtually, work, working with stations, as Ms. Spain has shared already. Um, we will have a lot of options available to us, and our teachers are excited about having students back in the building, and we're also able to have an exciting um, team with our ILCs, our librarians. Um, again, there will be challenges. Um, we've acknowledged those. But as we start to gear back towards having um, students both in the building and also working from home, the professional learning experiences that we've been engaging um, teachers in really since summer um, has really helped to prepare us to ensure an optimum learning experience for our students. Michael Jackson, principal of Hermitage High School. How about the high school perspective? All right, thank you. I'm very well said. Um, we want to meet the needs of your child, um, bottom line. If your child is virtual right now, we want to continue to support them um, through that platform and continue to, um, you know, continue to, to con um, complete assignments that way. If your child is in person, will it look different? Yes, it will look different because we have to now follow CDC guidelines. But teachers are prepared and will be prepared to meet the needs of your individual student. And we will continue to do so to make sure they're successful um, throughout the course of the school year. Michael, thank you. And, and Donna, in exceptional education, uh, what would you like to say to those families uh, along any of these questions? And do I, would you like me to repeat them? No, I'm actually I'm able to, to read them, but um, I, I think it's not just from a special education standpoint, but also from a general standpoint in education. I, I've heard from so many parents throughout the first nine weeks, and they've talked to me through email and through phone conversations about how creative their teachers are, how innovative they are, these really great, robust, virtual experiences that have been created for students. And the same thing is going to happen when your students return to school. It's, it's going to look different, especially in some of our more nuanced um, classroom environments. It may be that teachers are having to simultaneously teach students who are virtual, while there are also students who are in person in their classrooms. We're going to do that, and we're going to do it well. We have personnel at our disposal. We have different technology devices that are available. Our teachers are really versed at using small group instruction, station teaching, parallel teaching, all of these different ways to plan and deliver instruction to students in whatever environment it is that the student's engaging from. So as a mom, I, I know that you must, I, personally as a mom, I know the trepidation you must be feeling in making this decision, but I want to encourage you that there's really no wrong decision here. Our students are going to be instructed and they're going to be instructed well in either environment. Donna, thank you very much. And I heard bits and pieces of this next question. My notes reflected, if we didn't cover this earlier, we could go over it, but it has to do with iPads and Chromebooks during in-person learning. Donna, I'll, I'll stay with you for just a second, and maybe you can share some thoughts on the use of iPads and Chromebooks uh, with uh, exceptional education moving forward. Of course. So we, um, in Henrico, we've always been really proud of the technology that we use in our classrooms. And our students are still, even if they come back for in-person instruction, going to be accessing technology as a part of their instructional day. Um, our youngest learners and some of our students with more um, significant disabilities may be using iPads or they may be using assistive technology devices that are above and beyond the traditional laptop. Um, so it really just does, de does depend on what a student needs in order to access that instruction. I, I do want to reiterate as you're making these decisions that instruction in our in-person classrooms is not going to look like the traditional classroom environment. Um, things like circle time and sitting on carpets and being able to move freely about the classroom, those are gonna, those are gonna be different. So 
our students are going to be engaged in their personal learning spaces to a greater extent than perhaps they would um, previously in the classroom environment. So have that in mind as you are making the decision about what learning environment is appropriate for your child. Donna, thank you. Let's hear from our principals a little bit more on this topic. I'll start with Michael Jackson from Herman. It's the same question. Will the st students still be using, in, in your case, laptops during in-person learning? Yes. I think the answer is yes. yes. <laughs> That's yes. a pretty yeah, easy one. Same thing for, for uh, middle school as well, where we've been a one-to-one -one school division for many years. So uh, it dawns on me, of course, that this is more a question for Tracy in the elementary level. So Tracy, perhaps you would elaborate on, on the use of iPads and Chromebooks moving forward. So yes, our younger students will use iPads and uh, grades first through uh, fifth will use their Chromebooks as they have been. Um, but the in-person experience will be more about some paper pencil tasks, some project-based learning, things that uh, get students to collaborate together, but they will have opportunities to also use the computer in an in-person setting to collaborate with the students that are learning virtual so that they can keep their classroom communities together and those friendships and bonds and relationships that they have already established through this first nine weeks. Tracy, thank you. We're going to spend some time in just a little bit getting into some next steps and what comes uh, after we are informing our communities. But before uh, we get that. Th this question does get into choice. Donis, I'll start with you on it. And the question is, can we choose different settings for each of our children? One be virtual and the other in person or vice versa? And, and the answer is absolutely. Um, one of my favorite words in exceptional education is the word individualized. This is an individualized decision. You have to work collaboratively with your family, with your child, with your child's teachers to make the decision that's best for them. I think of a couple of different situations, and, and um, for example, I know of a family who has a, a child who has a reading disability, and that child has flourished in the virtual environment. There has been something that has clicked um, with the virtual instruction that they've received, the small group instruction, the targeted, specially designed instruction that they've received, and within the past three months, the child has grown half a grade level in their reading ability. And the parents are really confident in maintaining that virtual instruction for that student. The student has a sibling who is one of our early childhood students who has autism. And the student requires hand over hand support in order to be able to engage in any of those um, projects or any of those instructional circumstances which they need to do in order to make growth. So I could fully see this family making the decision for the older sibling to stay home and do virtual instruction while sending that student, to, the younger sibling, to school for in-person learning. And that's acceptable. You're making these decisions for your individual children based on their individual needs. We talk about decisions, and I'm going to save that for a little bit later. We have a little bit less than a half hour left in our time together, but there are a few other topics that we'll address before we close it out with more on that. And we're going to shift more back to the facilities realm, Susan. And this question comes to us, and it says, have, have the schools been upgraded, or have they up... I can't read this. Have the schools been upgraded to filters or filtration systems that are HEPA certified to remove bacteria from the air and will there be future resources to continue replacing those filters within the standard replacement period? So in short, Susan, let's spend some time discussing our air quality and our controls over that respect. All right, Andy. Um, the CDC and ASHRAE, which is the, uh, the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers, that's the industry go-to, and the CDC does reference ASHRAE. We've been following um, what the recommendations and the guidelines are for the, both of those organizations for these past few months. And what they recommend is if your systems can handle it to upgrade your filters to a MERV 13 or MERV 14. Now, MERV 13s and 14s, MERV is about what the um, airflow rating and how much, what size particulate the filter will let go through in the process of air passing through. The higher the number, the denser the filter. So your systems have to be able to handle 
the higher rated or higher MERV ratings on those filters. We're in the process of looking at all of our systems. We have the engineering group from Mosley Architects, as well as um, two companies. One is Siemens Industry Incorporated. The other is Automated Logic. And these are companies that help us with our building automation system, or BAS. You might hear us refer to the BAS system. Um, just to give you an idea with the filters we have, when we do a filter change, we use over 6,200 filters to make one filter change throughout all of our schools. Uh, an average school can have anywhere from 80 to 100 filters within the building within the components within the building. Um, we have committed, as we are looking at what filtering s filters can be upgraded, we have committed to changing our filters every six weeks to two months. Um, that is an increase from about four times a year under our normal cycling. And then the schools that can handle the higher grade filters, we, some of our newer schools can handle those higher grade filters. They've already been switched over to a MERV 13. Uh, the video you just saw was Glen Allen High School, and those units do have the MERV 13 in them. Um, as part of our mechanical process in evaluating our building preparedness, uh, we have also got Siemens and Automated Logic looking at implementation of how much ventilation we can bring into our buildings. Uh, again, all of this ties into our system and the system has to be able to bring that air into the building, condition it and properly condition it and get it into the space. They'll also be looking at um, changing, uh, excuse me, changing our temperature set points. So by adjusting those temperature set points, it will make our systems run more efficiently as well as keep more air going through the building as the system runs. One thing that we're also doing is a process called air flushing. What that means is we're continually running air through the building and we're doing that for two hours before the school day starts and for two hours after the school day ends. That is another recommendation by ASHRAE. Uh, and as part of the process that Siemens and Automated Logic is helping us with, uh, we're identifying any areas, any components that we need to make repairs in uh, and making those necessary repairs. Just to give you an idea, we have over 500 different systems or pieces of equipment that they are looking at. Um, that's a lot of, of units and a lot of time, but our, uh, we have qualified, certified HVAC technicians. They have been going out there, they have been working on these units along with Siemens and Automated Logic. So we have been very diligently working to make sure those mechanical systems are providing the best air quality within our schools that they possibly can. Susan Moore, Director of Facilities, thank you very much for, for that explanation. Let's switch gears now to social emotional support. Dr. Austin, I'll start with you to discuss this at the elementary level. What kinds of emotional support can you provide to help with the transition? This brings to mind the Wellness Wednesdays that are factored into our, uh, our calendar for in-person or expanded in-person learning, but I, I imagine there's more to it than that. There is, and the easy answer is whatever it takes to support our students. And so we want to make sure that the safety and well-being, and we emphasize that well-being, because if they're going to have the highest level of success, whether they are virtual or in person, then they need to feel safe and they need to feel good about themselves, their social and emotional health. And so as a division, we've put a lot of systems and structures in place since March. And so I'll call attention to some of the division level structures and wellness Wednesday is the most recent and so as we as we're making this transition adjustment in our schedule of the day you will notice that it is still a priority that SEL which is social and emotional learning is a priority on Wednesday specifically and every day so during predominantly virtual learning that was one of the main pieces that we put at the front of our schedule we wanted to make sure that we were checking in on children before we began teaching children. And so, and, and they're just not going to be able to have the maximum capacity 
to grow and to develop and to learn that day unless that is taken care of. So that's one of the divisional structures. We also have a number of things in play from a year ago, and we, we brought in the SEL curriculum that everybody at the elementary level has been trained in and is, is actually implementing. We are starting to become pretty good experts at that curriculum. Our counseling departments have offered full virtual support throughout um, you know, the spring and certainly this fall. In addition, we've used CARES Act funding to secure a handful of additional counseling positions that are ready to, to support schools that we believe will need support. And so the bottom line there is we still want to make sure our kids are, are ready to learn through social and emotional learning. And so um, we also want to make sure that our counselors are ready to go. Our counseling departments have been reaching out to families, hopefully whenever you need it, whenever you ask for it. There are a number of ways to reach out and, and request that assistance. Um, those school counseling departments will continue to be free from the master schedule at the elementary level so that they can be very, very responsive as quickly as possible when a need is identified. And that's one place where I'll reach out to the parents right now and I'll ask you to let us know during this transition if you have concerns or even want to ask questions about the best way to support. We want to hear from you and we want to be able to provide that level of support for their social and emotional well-being at the division level. And we also have specific things at the school level that I think we'll talk about next. Stacy, thank you for elaborating on the elementary perspective. I'll turn to our principals for middle and high school. Thomas McCauley, can you speak to the importance of social and emotional support, not just at Pocahontas Middle School, but throughout all of our schools? Yes, absolutely. And I really liked how Dr. Austin stated, whatever it takes. And in the middle school and secondary schools, you know, whatever it takes to create a strong culture and climate is what we're going to do. That has been one of our biggest challenges in a virtual world is making sure our students feel connected to not just their teachers who are doing a Herculean effort of identifying and connecting with their students, but also connecting to their individual schools too. Part of that school pride that really makes the educational experience so special. So that has been one of our charges. I was th really pleased to see from the board when they adopted the idea of having the sixth graders and also the ninth graders report a little bit earlier. Many of our sixth graders have not stepped foot into our schools um, at all. And if they have, maybe back last January. And so just to provide them a little bit of time to get acclimated um, to their middle school setting is really going to set forth an opportunity for us to immediately build that school culture, that pride. And really, once we do that, we're going to be able to pull in our students, and they're going to give us our very best. But we, I was really, it was really great to see, again, um, having the sixth graders come in a little bit earlier. And I'll let um, Dr. Jackson speak about the ninth grade experience and what they're doing in the high schools. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, the uh, social emotional learning is uh, very important to developing the whole child. And, you know, it's just very important that we focus on this as we move forward. Um, the past eight months have been uh, like a traumatic event to students. And HCPS is working very diligently to meet the needs of all students um, to make sure they have all that they need in order to be successful um, when they eventually return to the building. Uh, like uh, Mr. McCauley said, I am excited that uh, freshmen can return to the building on February 2nd, uh, February 1st and 2nd, and we could ease them back into the building because they also they have not been over to the building unless they came in January. So it's very important that we uh, take full advantage of this transition and uh, meet all the needs of everyone involved. Michael, thank you. Uh, this next question I think will be a relatively short one and then we will spend some time talking about timelines and what happens next. But this question submitted to us from uh, several folks in the parent community, will parents be allowed to enter the building and or volunteer? And uh, Donna, who our Director of Exceptional Education, perhaps you'd like to speak to that. So. As you know, we're, we're truly committed to maintaining the safest and healthiest environment for our students and our staff. And as such, we are trying to limit the number of people who are coming into our building for sustained periods of time. Because of that, we are not going to have um, those same types of volunteer opportunities that parents may have had in our schools previously. We're also going to continue to conduct our meetings virtually, so special education meetings, 
504 meetings, parent-teacher conferences. We're gonna continue to conduct those virtually in order to maximize social distancing and to maintain the safest and healthiest environment that we can for our students and our staff. And Thomas, at the secondary level, does that sound pretty, sound pretty consistent on your end too? It's extremely consistent um, at the secondary level. So I just wanted to share, while the classrooms will have a different experience and feel um, in many cases, so will the experience for parents who maybe are accustomed to some of the conveniences of being just to stop into the school, um, possibly drop off a lunch, um, drop off a notebook. Uh, we're going to need to relook and um, reevaluate that practice and really limit the opportunities for parents to come into the building just as Ms. Davenport was sharing. So again, some of those conveniences will not be um, allowed. However, that's in the interest of everyone's safety. And with proper planning, we really do not feel it would be um, a letdown much at all. All right, Thomas, thank you. This next question is one that we addressed earlier this afternoon as well during a, a session that was geared primarily toward HCPS employees, but the question applies to the student household audience as well. And uh, will families who choose in-person learning be permitted to switch their choice and do virtual learning? Is there a certain amount of time that families must commit to their choice? So uh, Dr. Farrell, I'll start with you on this and you shared some thoughts during the previous session that I think are relevant to share during this session as well as it relates to an upcoming choice that we'll be asking families to, be ma to make. Right, and, and to uh, Mrs. Davenport's um, uh, remarks earlier, you know, we're encouraging all of our families to be intentional, <clears throat> excuse me, about making a decision regarding their students' uh, return to in-person learning or whether or not they remain virtual. Because once a decision is made, that decision will be a, a year-long commitment. So if a family likes to remain virtual or to return for in-person learning, um, that would be a commitment that families are making for the remainder of the school year. Now, we do understand that there may be some mitigating circumstances that would call for um, the, the school teams to, to look at certain uh, situations. And those would be situations that the school teams would discuss and make a decision on. But for the most part, um, there's just a whole lot that goes into sort of revamping a, a school schedule and a school year to ensure that, you know, a student's schedule is not compromised with respect to the classes that they're currently taking. And again, we're gonna do our very best to maintain the classes that our students are taking with no guarantees as to whether or not they'll have the same teachers or the same classes during the same class periods. Um, it becomes increasingly complicated if, you know, students were to, you know, decide to either um, return for in-person and then decide to go virtual or vice versa. Um, there would be no guarantee that we would be able to maintain their, their classes. So I think um, with us really sort of um, getting families to commit one way or the other, it gives us a better chance of ensuring that our students have the classes that they've selected uh, for this academic school year. And for families of students in middle or high school, what can they expect over about the next week? They'll be hearing from their schools and, and when they have questions, what would, you, what would your advice be to families of middle and high school students? My, my advice would be to reach out to the schools if you have questions regarding you know, in-person or um, virtual learning to to get the school's perspective on what that may look like look like for your student because um, in reality the schools are the ones that are well the staff in the schools are the ones that are actually doing the work um, with respect to preparing for what this next phase of education will look like in Henrico County Public Schools so I would say reach out to your schools if you have any questions regarding um, a return to in-person learning or whether or not you would like for your student to remain a, a virtual learner. Thomas, thank you. Stacy. I'll turn it over to you for an elementary perspective. Same question. Let's go over the timelines and what families of students at elementary schools can expect and what to do when they have questions. Absolutely. Uh, I'll start with the last so that I can follow up Thomas's um, advice. I would, I would advise parents and students, those of you who are listening at, uh, today, I'm super proud of you for your agency and your voice. Um, talk to your parents. Be honest. Be open collect information. But if you are seeking information, please go to the accurate source. And so there's a lot of information on social media that our division and Andy's department puts out that is, that is there for you. And then there are some other posts that, that are not endorsed by the school system. So I would say, seek the information that you need for your discernment, because this is a choice. And we want you to make the right choice for your student and for your family, and we're gonna be here to support you. 
As far as uh, some of the other questions, it, there is no guarantee as far as um, you know, the placement with a teacher. We talked a little bit about that. I will tell you, our building teams, our principals, their teachers, they are, they're measuring each room. They're looking for the maximum capacity for in-person because we want to make sure that the folks who choose to send their students back to the building can do that safely distance under the guidance from our medical experts. We're going to do what we can. There will be hard choices. Um, there will be moments where if, if a teacher needs more capacity of space, we may trade out where that instructional space is. For instance, a music room tends to be a little larger in the elementary schools. That could be a home room, and then the music teacher could go to a smaller instructional space to do their instruction. So we're gonna be making difficult choices, and we've gotta limit disruptions. And you know, the movement between virtual and in-person would create that level of disruption. So we, we're going to have to, again, ask that you honor your commitment to intent either way whichever way you go please let us know um, we're going to talk i think in a few minutes a little bit about the next steps on how to do that but again to echo dr farrell um, talk to your principal talk to your teacher um, if you have questions we want to get you the answers that's the whole purpose of this town hall today is to get you the, the information you need to make the best decision for your family. And, and Stacy, now is a good time to get into some of that timeline and what comes next. And, and any conversation like this is at the 30,000 foot level is always going to stop a little bit short of the specifics that families are, are craving at this moment in time. And that, that, that speaks to every school having unique circumstances. And so before we get into timelines, which we need to soon, um, speak to the value of contacting your, your principal or, or a teacher or a trusted administrator at the school and why we might recommend that path forward for families who need more information. The, they're the experts along with you. We, we've built a partnership either this year or previous years. We have families that have been connected to teams at buildings for years and, and that has been a product of many, many conversations you as a parent you're the first teacher and that has never been more important than right now during this transition you've been our partner through predominantly virtual learning you were our partner back in the spring when we had to do things completely different and we don't expect that to change we still want to be your partner we still want to reach out and and, and connect and make any information available um, to a, to a teacher um, or to a parent that is trying to make a decision right now. Um, again, we wanna coach you through that. It may be that you just need a listening ear to voice what you're thinking inside. Um, and we're here to do that because we, we care that much about you and about your child. And I asked that question because I know there's about 30,000 words on our website right now and it'd be easy for us to look into the camera and say, just go to our website and you'll find it. But the truth is it's hard and it's time consuming to find all of that information. There's a lot and we're glad it's up there, but developing or, or relying on those personal relationships will help families navigate this decision. So what happens next? This came up during the employee town hall earlier this afternoon and we talked about a timeline for employees that involved uh, messaging on Friday all throughout next week, at which point we will start to get a sense of what our employees would like to do. Is it similar for the student households moving forward or what can our families expect? Absolutely, I'll try to walk parents through it. In earlier today, I described it as a chicken and egg scenario. And which came first, the chicken or the egg? Which comes first, the teacher decision or the parent decision? And the answer is we're gonna do those at the same time. And so we have mirrored that timeline because we need the decision. Now that the vote has happened, our plan is in place, we're moving forward to get things ready for your students. And so what we're gonna ask is that every parent let us know what their intention is. And we talked a little bit before about we need to know that and, and we need to know it for the, for the year. And so plans have to be made, adjustments have to be made. We, we wanna be able to tell you that your homeroom teacher that you've come to love for the last eight weeks is gonna be with you. And, and we can't promise you that, we can't guarantee you that. But what we can do 
is tell you that we're going to aim and we're going to strive to keep relationships in play. And if it's not in the homeroom teacher to homeroom student, it will be some other way. We'll find other opportunities throughout the building to connect friends and to connect staff members that are beloved in your home. So we will be doing that throughout this week on Friday. Um, there, there will be some information that will come out and we're gonna have about a week to process that. Some of you may have already made your decision. Some of you may still be thinking. Some of you may be a long way from that decision. But what our timeline will be about a week starting this Friday. And a shorter way, and I know this is easy for me to say, but it, give us a chance to let us show you how we are gonna work with our families to, to make this work. No matter what option is best for your particular family, let us show you how we can work together to make that decision together. Absolutely, and, and a lot of that is gonna be just taking the information you receive, processing it, asking a question, and uh, we're here to answer those questions. All right, Stacy Austin, thank you very much. In the limited amount of time that we have left, I want each of our panelists to have a, kind of a, a closing thought, uh, to share some things that are on their minds, or to reiterate some points that came up during our, our past 90 minutes or so together. And I'll start on this side with uh, Michael Jackson, the, the principal of Hermitage, for some closing thoughts. Thank you, and um, thank families for joining us this evening. Um, also, thank you for your patience, um, as the, there is no perfect answer right now. Um, just understand that we all want to be back in school, but we have to do it safely. And safely means for our students as well as our faculty. Um, I encourage you to uh, stay in communication with your principals and your schools to, for clarification on any question that you may have. Uh, so stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you again. And for my Hermitage family listening, roll pride. Michael, thank you. Donna Davenport, Director of Exceptional Education. I just want to reiterate that thank you for the patience and the grace that you've all shown us as we have figured out how to do our new normal. Um, and we've encouraged you throughout our conversation tonight to reach out to your case manager, to your teacher, to your principals to ask questions. And I'm going to um, put a little plug in for them right now as well. They may not have all the answers just yet. So continue with that patience ask the questions. We will get the information to you as soon as we can. Just know that we're all working together to do what's best for your children. Thomas McCauley, principal of Pocahontas Middle School. Yes, thank you. And just want you to know, families, that we are listening. We know this is difficult and has been a difficult time going all the way back to the first school closure in March. Your school admin team, your teachers, your support, central office, Again, we are listening. We are doing what is best for children in terms of safety and following the guidelines. And as others have said, first, I want to say thank you. And thank you for your patience um, and continue that partnership with the schools. It cannot be reiterated enough. And one final plug as we're nearing the end of the first nine weeks, I do encourage you to log into PowerSchool, check your students' grades, reach out, and have your students reach out if they're of, of an appropriate age um, to their teachers just to make sure that uh, we do end the first nine weeks very strong as we move forward into the second nine weeks. All right, Thomas, thank you. Tracy Spain, principal of Springfield Park Elementary School. And I just want to um, express my sincere gratitude to all of the families. We have so appreciated you partner, partnering with us and supporting our teachers and all of our students uh, as we have moved through this first nine weeks. We are committed to the safety and health of all of our students. We're putting the practices in place to make sure that everybody is safe. And I encourage you just to continue to reach out to your teachers and administration so that we can answer any questions that you have so that you can make the best informed decision for your student. Thomas Farrell, Director of High School Education. Thank you, uh, Andy. I think you said we received over 800 questions from our community, and uh, that's a demonstration of a high level of engagement um, that we have with our community. So I want to say thank you to all of those who submitted questions, um, those that have been reaching out to give us information and guidance and, and feedback and input. Um, this really is a, a collective effort on a part of all of us to make this work for our students. Um, so I would encourage our community to continue to partner with us, extend a little patience and grace to our schools as they work to try to provide our students with the best educational experience possible. Um, again, thank you so much and um, don't hesitate to reach out 
you know, should you have additional questions regarding a return to uh, school plan? Stacy Austin, one of our three directors of elementary education. I'm going to close with a little philosophy because I'm a firm believer that we all need a little adversity to build resilience. But my goodness, how resilient are we going to be? Um, I want to tell you how proud I am of, of you as a family, as a community. I am proud to work and be a leader in Henrico County Public Schools because we have put safety first. We have put students in the middle of every conversation. We have protected our staff. We have put safeguards in place for you as a family. We've put supports to make sure that our kids are okay to come back or to stay virtual. It's your choice now. We can't wait to hear from you. And uh, I look forward to the, to the future where we have these students with this resilience that they're building, solving the world's problems in front of us. So thank you for joining us tonight. Susan Moore, Director of Facilities. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I'd just like to say I echo all of the, the thoughts that have been brought forward by all of the other panelists. And I would just like to add that all of us, uh, school staff as well as central office staff, facilities, uh, every manner of staff member we have, whether they be at the highest level or the lowest level, we're working diligently and earnestly to be the village to provide our Henrico County Public School kids with the safest environment there is, whether it's working on our HVAC systems to make sure they're in good working order, or our enhanced cleaning processes, buying additional sanitizing equipment to make sure the buses are cleaned between routes and that our schools can, the high touch areas can be cleaned multiple times during the day as well as the classrooms to be sanitized each night. So we're looking at all of those different avenues that we can make sure that when you make the decision to bring your kids back in person, that we're giving them the best possible atmosphere that we can. Susan, thank you. Dr. Danny Avula. And Danny, in addition to the closing thoughts that you've been thinking about, we had you in the, in the last session explain about working together in the name of public health. And I wondered if you might share yeah. some thoughts on that as we close out our evening. Absolutely. Um, you know, I've been absolutely blown away by the thoughtfulness and the rigor of my colleagues in Henrico Public Schools, both in the virtual education rollout, but now also in planning for return to school. Um, and, and also in just the way that, that they have listened really well to the families of Henrico who ultimately this school system belongs to. And so I want you all to hear that as a, as a, uh, a teammate and a bystander that, that what has happened behind the scenes is really incredible. Um, I also, you know, Stacy said earlier that this is a deeply personal decision and the, the decision to return to school in person isn't the right one for everyone. If you've got elderly folks at home or people with underlying conditions, it may not be th worth the risk, but you all have to make that decision for your own family. Um, for those of you who do come back, uh, we really have the utmost faith that you all will uh, teach your kids how to wear masks properly and prep them for what distancing looks like and that you all will screen your kids for symptoms and keep them home even with mild symptoms. That's going to be really important uh, because all of us have to do this together to ensure a good outcome as, as kids come back. And so um, I'm really encouraged by what I've seen. I'm encouraged by what I'm hearing out in the community. Uh, and I really look forward to a, a successful in-person return. All right, Dr. Avula, thank you very much. And, and just a closing thought on what comes next. We had two sessions today. One earlier this afternoon was for HCPS employees. This session was designed with questions from our student households in mind. Recordings of both have been made. And as we mentioned at the top of the program, we purposely spoke with our masks on, but for those who rely on closed captioning or lip reading, we will be posting a recording of this session to our YouTube page so that you can access it with uh, captions beginning tomorrow. But in the meantime, for additional information, and I know we sort of made light of this just a moment ago, but if you go to our webpage, henricoschools.us slash return to school, that has more information recapping how we got here, what's next, and we give you our assurances that there will be more information and more fine-grained details to come as we move along in this process together. For all of us here at Henrico County Public Schools, 
Thank you for watching, and we hope you have a great night.